Well, good morning. Welcome to Walden Community Church. My name is David, and I am the pastor here. We are starting our second week at looking at the life of Joseph. And I, I chose to do Joseph now because I was just, I, was, I think I was just itching for a story, right? I wanted a story, something we could do, maybe something that was topical, that would relate to what we are all going through. And, you know, a story's got characters and a plot and a, a resolution that usually has mountains to climb, valleys to go through, dreams to capture. And uh, I, that's how I see Joseph. I see Joseph as this person that is obtainable and reachable and human like us. And if you were to summarize Joseph, you, you'd say he was a dreamer. We talked about last week that Joseph has a God-sized dream in his life, and right now he's having some trouble capturing that. And so we're calling this Dream On, The Life of Joseph. Dream On is a, a song by Aerosmith. It's a popular song. It's a song I like. And right now I see Joseph as this dreamer that's trying to step into maybe the vision or the plan that God has for him. When last we saw him, Joseph was 17 years old. Uh, he's young, he's immature, he's got a little bit of growing up to do. He is the 10th son of Jacob. He, ha he has 10 older brothers, 10 older jealous brothers who had stripped him of his cloak, sold him into slavery. They saw a caravan of Midianites passing by. They were heading off to Egypt and they traded Joseph for money. So let's we finish out that chapter, chapter 37 in Genesis. It says, then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, this we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And notice they say your son, not necessarily our brother. Jacob identified it and said, this is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without a doubt torn to pieces. And then Jacob tore his own garment and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son in mourning. And thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him to Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. So Joseph's brothers take his coat they soak it in animal's blood. They take it to their father, Jacob. And that was kind of their way of covering their tracks, right? Covering their lie, putting some convincing facts on this tall tale. And hopefully it'll convince dad that Joseph is gone and that he doesn't need to go and look for him. And who knows? I mean, maybe Joseph would die as a slave. There's probably no reason to think otherwise. Slaves didn't have a lot of rights. Slaves were mistreated. They were malnourished, abused. They were beaten. There's maybe no reason to assume that their brother wouldn't survive. But what a crazy day for Joseph. I can't, I can't even imagine this day. Joseph wakes up that morning. He is the favored son of a chieftain father, lives an easy life, has all of his needs met. One day, dad says, can you go run an errand for me? And he goes to check on his older brothers. They see you coming. They plot against you. They strip you. They throw you into a pit, starve you, sell you to slave traders. And then in, within a week, you're sold off the auction block to an Egyptian official. So who is this? Who is this Egyptian official? Who is Potiphar? Well, the Bible uh, tells us in verse 36 that he is the officer to Pharaoh. He's the captain of the guards. Genesis 39, verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of the house and put him in charge of all that he had. So it's a good thing. This is a good thing that Potiphar bid on Joseph, took him home. Because for whatever reason, uh, Potiphar is sympathetic toward Joseph, treats him well. And did you catch that 
reason for Joseph's success. What does the Bible say? It says the Lord was with Joseph, right? Joseph was far from home. He's far from his family. He is a stranger in a strange land. But that doesn't also mean that he's far from God. I think when bad things happen to us and we think that we are alone, we are abandoned, nobody knows what we're going through, and we ask, why me? I'm sure those are the same thoughts that were in Joseph's mind. That's natural. You know, what did I do, God? How, you know, what did I do to deserve this? Why is this happening to me? It's a question that's going to come up again and again in Joseph's life. He's going to have to learn the answer to this, and, and we will too. We will learn this answer along with Joseph, just not today. Why me is a question that we all wrestle with, though, in life, isn't it? Not just Joseph. He's not the only one in the Bible. What about Mary? Uh, Mary's the mother of Jesus. An angel visits Mary, and she says, are you sure you picked the right person for this? I'm a little young to be having a baby, right? She says that. A few weeks ago, we looked at Moses. God calls him the burning bush, and Moses says, you've got the wrong person, right? Back in the Old Testament, idolatry is running rampant. Ahab and Jezebel are corrupting everything they touch, and God grabs Elijah and says, I want you, just you, to take a stand against all of this corruption, all of this evil. And I'm sure Elijah thought the same thing. Like, are you sure you have the right person? I, I'm just one guy. Jonah, go to Nineveh. <laughs> Noah, build a boat. I think the great thing that we learn from these characters, that we learn from Joseph, is that God calls us to this God-sized dream. And then he doesn't leave us. We are not left to do it on our own. The Bible says the Lord was with Joseph. Our graduates that we're celebrating today, they are, for the most part, leaving. They're either leaving our youth group, they're leaving home, they're leaving their city, they're going to another state, they're leaving their school, and, and their minds could be nervous, they could be scared, they could have these questions about leaving behind things they know and things they trust, but the good news is you can't outrun God. You cannot leave God. He always goes with us. So God has not left Joseph. Even when he was in the bottom of the pit, even when he was on the caravan ride to Egypt, even, even when he was on the auction block, God was with him through all of that. But there's also another little interesting thing that's mentioned there in verse 3. I don't know if we all saw it, but it says, when his master saw that the Lord was with him. Have you ever had to tell somebody that you were a Christian? <laughs> I remember doing that once with a friend that I worked with. She asked me about my beliefs, and I said that I was a Christian. And, and do you know what she said? She said, you're a Christian? Ouch. Joseph doesn't have to go and tell Potiphar, hey, by the way, I'm a God-fearer. He doesn't say, hey, I worship Yahweh. I have beliefs. The Bible says that Potiphar could see it for himself. How? And Jesus says in Matthew 7, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, you will recognize them by their fruits. How would your neighbors or your friends know that you were a Christian? How would they know that? By the language that you use? By the words that you speak? By the jokes that you tell? By the gossip that you share? by the way that you live, by the advice that you give. The Bible says that your identification as a Christian is the fruit that your life bears. Does your life bear fruit? Absolutely, everyone does, right? And that's either good or bad, the Bible says. Don't think for a moment 
that a life that bears bad fruit, which would be sin in your life, right? Don't think for a moment that other people don't notice that. Your life is a testimony that speaks for itself. Potiphar notices. He sees that Joseph is a good guy. He's a trustworthy guy. Joseph earns the respect of his employer. And the Bible says that Joseph is put in charge of all of Potiphar's estate, second only to the master himself. He's the chief steward. That's great, right? It's not bad for a guy who was recently sold as a common slave. Last week, we talked about the God-sized dream that God has in Joseph's life. And perhaps, uh, I think, if, if you were Joseph, this would be one of those moments where you felt like it's all coming together. God's plan is starting to come together. The wheels are starting to spin here. We're making some progress. Maybe even uh, you, you would thank God, hopefully, for your blessing. Thank him for rescuing you, for giving you this position, for giving you this status. Let's hope so. What do, what do we read if we continue in the story? Verse 6. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Uh-oh. <laughs> this, this can't be good. You can almost hear the whole story shift. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. It's almost like saying, but, right? Joseph is well built and handsome. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being in shape. There's nothing wrong with having a nice body or being healthy or being attractive. But know that one of the things that Joseph struggles with is his ego, right? And we saw that in the previous story. He's immature and he's having some trouble seeing the larger picture outside of himself. His world is still just as big as he can see. It revolves around him. So what happens next? Verse seven. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. Now, I just need to ask, I mean, do I need to, do I need to explain this passage? Do I have to break it down? Do we need to look at the Hebrew to understand it? I think we get it right? We, we all know what's happening here. Uh, her husband is away on business or away for the day, and she is making advances. So what does Joseph do? Verse 8, but he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? That is a great response. Great response. That is exactly what we want Joseph to say. It's number one answer, right? Joseph says, I can't. I can't do this because it's a betrayal of my boss, right? And because it would be a sin against God. Those are two great reasons. But verse 10 says, and as she spoke to Joseph, day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. The Bible says, day after day, which means she won't give up. She's relentless. And do we think that in all of this time, she's just asking, you know, casually, as you would with friends, just passing by in the hallway? Do we think she's just sending him a casual text? Or do we think she ups her game day after day, that she tries harder, that she's more persistent, that she tried different things to get what she wants. You know, addiction to sexual imagery is not the isolated problem that it used to be. It used to be guarded, protected magazines on the top rack in the liquor store. Now it's an epidemic. Now it's a pandemic of huge proportions. And every few months it gets worse. Why? Because internet use doubles 
every 100 days. Sexual imagery and temptation affects everyone. It hunts you down on television. It's in our magazines, both for men and women. It's all over the internet. You don't even have to try to find it. Just like Potiphar's wife, it will find you. It will lure you in. You could be a perfectly innocent internet user browsing the web, come across a porn pornographic picture and be sucked in. And within minutes, you can be hooked. There are people in every town, every community, every job, every church that are struggling with these sexual images and they are too afraid, they are too ashamed, they are too embarrassed to tell anyone about it for fear of what other people will think of them. Somebody said, the church shoots its wounded. We don't do that here. At Walden Church, we believe in the restoration and the healing of God. We believe in grace. We believe that none of us are perfect. We believe that we all need forgiveness. And we are reading the story of Joseph because this is a human story. Joseph is a real life person who has a real life father and real life brothers and a broken family. And Joseph struggles with the same pitfalls and the same blessings in life that we all do. Joseph is in a good place. He's succeeding. He's got a leg up in the world. So this is a good time for his stability and his beliefs to be tested. But this time he's not tested with fame and he's not tested with glory like he was with his brothers. No, this time he's being tempted with sex and lust because he's a little older now. And these are probably things that he's struggling with now at this point in his life. Now his loyalty is being tested with his boss. And the Bible says she comes after him day after day. I don't care. Whatever your addiction is, whatever darkness follows you, whatever you wrestle with, we have our, we have our daily victories where we succeed and we say, that was a good day. But then the next day when we get up, we have to wrestle with them again, don't we? Verse 11 says, but one day, and just like that, it's over. Just like in life, we succeed on one day, we struggle against our sin, we struggle against our darkness, we struggle against our temptation until one day. Verse 11 says, but one day, when he went into the house to do his work and none of the men were in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. Now I know at first glance it looks like Joseph again is the victim here, but let's look at the facts. Joseph came into the house to do his work knowing full well that the two of them would be alone. Joseph is placing himself in a situation where he knows he is going to be entering into temptation. It's kind of like walking into a bar and saying, you know what, I'll be fine. I'm just going to order a Coke. The Bible says she grabs him by the coat. Now what do we think? Knowing her, knowing what she wants, does she grab him forcefully or does she grab him seductively? It makes a difference, doesn't it? Because whatever happens in this transaction, because the Bible doesn't really say, he leaves her presence and when he leaves, his clothing is still in her hands. And if Joseph is a strong man, a healthy man, like the Bible tells us earlier, how does Potiphar's wife end up with his coat? Is she really so strong that he wasn't able to pull away? Could he really not pull his garment away from her hand? Again, we don't have all of the story. 
but it seems like he made it a little too easy for her. Verse 13 says, And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I had lifted my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. Joseph's coat gets him in a lot of trouble, doesn't it? Here we are, back again, at his garment. Joseph's coat from his father, this special coat, got him in trouble, and his coat was later used to betray him. Now Joseph has a new coat from a new employer, and it's happened again. Tell me something. What emotion do you feel from Potiphar's wife coming off these pages? I'm picking up anger. This reads to me like a woman who has been scorned. Something happened, right? She's never turned on him before, day after day. She's never accused him before. It's always been playful. It's always been flirty. She's been dogging this guy and hounding poor Joseph since day one. So why does she now change her tune? What has suddenly made her angry? So angry that she wants her husband to come in and take care of it. I'm guessing Joseph gets caught up in his own story, in his own glory, and his brothers take him, strip him of his coat, and they sell him into slavery. Years later, Joseph gets caught up in his own story and his own glory, and this time his boss's wife strips him of his coat, and he's thrown into prison. It's the same story. I'm going to argue the side that he hasn't yet learned his lesson, and that this is why he's thrown in jail. He's in time out again. He's in jail, and it's not a reward. He's still not ready to embrace the larger story and the bigger plan that God has for his life. Verse 20 says, And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. How do you think Joseph feels now? Defeated. Like, I've been here before. Have you ever started a project and you felt like things were far along only to discover that one day you're back at square one or worse, you're actually further behind than where you started? That's where Joseph is. Have you ever felt like you were making headway on your temptation and your folly? You slayed those dragons and you turned that corner only to find that darkness had been biding its time and rallying against you and stabbing you in the back, and now you've fallen off the wagon. That's where Joseph is. Verse 21 says, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever he had done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. But while Joseph was in prison, what do we see? This time, God leaves him. That's three strikes are out. You're on your own, Joseph. No. No matter what Joseph does, no matter what the world throws at him, what happens? The Lord is with him, right? There are some of you here today, and you're here this morning, and the recent events of past weeks have been so unfair. And you have prayed, and you've obeyed, and you've done exactly what you felt 
God wanted you to do. You were tackling everything the world was throwing at you, and you had the confidence that everything was going to work out until it didn't. And for as much as the world is starting to reopen, and some things are going back to normal, for other people, this is just the beginning of even more struggle and more pain. I know it's hard. I know it doesn't make sense. Be strong. Be patient. If I were going to give you advice right now, it'd be the same advice that I would give Joseph. What do we see now? Twice from Joseph's life. Be strong. Be patient. I got a couple of things. Give your life to God. Give your whole life to God. I still think this is where Joseph lacks. He's holding out. He wants the God-sized dream that God has for his life, but he still sees the fame and the power that he gets out of it. And he is still boastful and he is still arrogant. He is keeping back part of his life for himself and he's not yet fully ready to commit. The book of Romans says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passion. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for unrighteousness. 1 Corinthians 6 says, You are not your own. Your life is not your own. It says you were bought at a price. This is something that Joseph has not yet learned. If you are given the gift that God has given you, if you are given the gift that God gave Joseph, there are so many things that you could step into and claim here. You know, we, we say that we give God our life. We pray the prayer and we say, God, I'm giving my eternity to you. But there's a part of us that holds back and holds out. God blesses us, gives us the God-sized dream. In Joseph's case, God's blessed him with this, this spirit, this, this power to interpret dreams. And yet, Joseph is still holding on to something that is too small. He's holding on to his own dream, and he has not yet learned to live for something bigger than himself. Give your whole life to God. You are not your own. Give your whole life to God. And then second, I would say, claim the promises that God has given you. Claim those promises. First Peter 1 says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. Joseph is given a God-sized dream, but his sights are too small. He's content with inheriting his father's estate. That's good enough for him. One day I will rule all of you. All of you will bow down to me. He's content with being in charge of Potiphar's estate. He says, your, your husband has given me everything. Everything except you. But God has a promise and a dream for him that's even bigger than that. And he just needs to take it. What, what are some of those promises? What are some of the promises that God gives us? There are hundreds in Scripture. There are hundreds of promises in Scripture that are there for you. Let's just look at some of the ones that Jesus tells us about. Here's just a couple of the promises that Jesus tells you about are yours. First, number one promise, like we've just seen with Joseph through this story, he is with you. He is with you. John 15, you are already clean because of the world. I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No matter what life throws at you, whether it's freedom or prison, whether it's success or failure, whether you're on the road to righteousness 
or being sucked into temptation, He is with you. Second promise, He will give you rest. God will give you rest. Matthew 11, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, I, I'm so anxious to get back into church and start everything again. I say, come on, let's start youth group. Let's start, you know, children's church. Let's start Bible studies. Let's do this and this. And, and people are saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Be patient, Pastor David. Slow down. And I said, why? We got, we got the whole summer to, to do stuff. You guys have all been on a break. You guys have all had rest. You've been two months of, of, of rest. And you know what people are saying? This hasn't been a rest. I'm tired. I'm stressed. I'm burnt out. I've been homeschooling. I've been worried about finances and my job. This hasn't been a vacation for me. You have a promise in Scripture that God will give you rest. That is one of His promises that you can claim. Third, He will make it possible. God will make it possible. Mark 10, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. That is a promise for you that you inherit as a child of God. Next, he will be with us to the end. Matthew 24, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. It's just like I said, what advice would I give you? What advice would I give Joseph? Be patient. It's not just that he is with us. He is with us to the end. Next, he has cleared the path. The next promise you can claim, he has cleared the path for you. John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble. Remember, this is, this is our verse from a couple of weeks ago. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I have already cleared the path. I have already made the crooked roads straight for you. Right? He is the shepherd. He protects us. He clears our path. Next promise, he has answered your prayer. Well, I haven't even prayed yet. It doesn't matter. He has answered your prayer. Mark 11, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Your prayers have been answered. Next promise. You have the light within you. Matthew 5 says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. You know, we talk about all the things that we can't do. But the Bible says that he has answered your prayer and you have the light within you. The Bible also says that you can do it. Matthew 9 says everything is possible for the one who believes. You can do it. How come you can do it? Because he has answered your prayer. Because you have the light within you. He has cleared the path. He will be with you to the end. These are all promises that you can claim. Well, I don't know. God has, God's picked the wrong one. Not me. Right? Somebody else. Somebody else can do that. Somebody else can lead a Bible study. Somebody else can teach Sunday school. Somebody else can be a deacon. Not me. What's your next promise? You have value. You have value. Matthew 6, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Yes, you. Yes, you. When Mary says, who me? When Moses says, who me? When Jonah and Noah say, are you sure you're picking me? Yes, you have value. And you can do it because you are rich. I don't have any resources. No, the Bible says you are rich. That is another promise from God. Matthew 6, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. They are God's riches, and they are given to you, and they lie, and they mound, and they pile up at your feet. 
These are your promises to claim. This book, this Bible is about you. This story is about you. The promises within this book are yours to claim. Joseph, look at Joseph. He is a flawed human being, right? He has ups, he has downs, just like you. Just when he thinks things are going great, boom, thrown into a pit, right? Just when he thinks everything's going great and he just got a raise and a promotion and a company car, what happens? Fired, right? Joseph sees the God-sized dream, but he hasn't yet shed off his own effort and his own hang-up and his own ego to claim it, and he keeps paying the price for it. Is there a third point? Of course there's a third point. This is a sermon. Sermons always have a third point. Nope, not this time. Give your life to God and claim the promises that God has for you. I only have two points. Give your whole life to God and claim those promises that God has given you. And if it's not happening, maybe as fast as you would like, then I would just say, take a lesson from Joseph, be strong, be patient. God will work it out. He's with you to the end. Trust his timing. Go back to his word, claim those promises, and then do it again. Be strong and be patient. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, when all is darkness and when we feel our weakest, when we feel helpless, we would just ask that you would give us a sense of your presence and your love and your strength. Help us to have the most perfect trust in your protecting love. Help us to have the most perfect trust in your strength and your power so that nothing frightens us, nothing worries us. And we know that by living close to you, we will see your hand and your purpose and your will through all things. Praise be to the Lord who has given rest to his people just as he promised. Not one word has failed of all the good promises. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our ancestors. May he never leave us nor forsake us. May he turn our hearts to him to walk in obedience to him and keep the commands, the decrees, the laws. And may these words of mine, which I have prayed before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God both day and night. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching this morning. Uh, this video, of course, is on YouTube, and we just ask that you uh, can take this link and you can share it to your own wall uh, on social media, or you can share it to a friend's page. Send it to them in an email if you think that they could benefit from it. Uh, I love you guys. We're here every week at the church, Monday through Friday from 9 to 3. You can send us an email or call us or come by and visit us. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.